Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for uh, this uh, CCL University lesson. Uh, really a special one, Dr. Andrew McDonald. He was with us uh, at the CCL National Conference this year, and uh, unfortunately, they uh, they had an overflow uh, crowd in in their room, in their uh, in their breakout room, and weren't able to uh, squeeze everybody in. So therefore, we invited them back to uh, do uh, or facilitate the lesson again, so we could record it and make it available to um, the larger CCL community. Or excuse me, the uh, well, larger CCL community, own community. All right. So uh, a couple of things. Um, I did just put in a uh, backup phone number and code in case your computer audio drops in the chat window. Um, we will stop for questions at the end, and you can press star one on your phone to unmute yourself, or uh, you can click the little microphone symbol next to your name that will um, unmute you. Um, the, obviously, obviously, the call is being recorded, and we'll provide the uh, recording on CCL Community uh, usually by the next day or so. All right, so I'm going to introduce uh, tonight's speaker. He's uh, Dr. Andrew McDonald, Assistant Professor of Oceanography at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Just found out as well that he's uh, from a Southern California guy. So uh, glad to have you on tonight, Doctor, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Ricky, and hello to everyone there. Um, yeah, we'll do questions at the end, like Ricky said. Uh, but yeah, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the oceans and global change, and in particular talk about some of the effects of warming on the ocean system and what it means for us. Uh, is there anything? Did somebody say something, Ricky? Was that you? Never mind. It looks like. Oh, uh, no, there's just a little. There's just a little feedback, and I just muted the line. Don't worry about it. Okay. I got it. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, if you take a look at the Earth from uh, out in space, as, as you can see in this, uh, this picture here, you can see you really get the perspective that, that the oceans are an integral part of the Earth system. And so essentially you have uh, the atmosphere and uh, the land and uh, the ocean. And so we can see that the oceans are dominating um, a large portion of the area of the earth and as such they are a key player in the earth's system and the earth's climate system so let's see if i can figure out how to go to the next one yeah so typically uh we're when we think about climate change we think about uh the global surface temperature and uh we we think about how that has risen over the last century or so. And here's a plot from, uh, from NASA GISS that's showing the, this uh, recent temperature trends um, over the last century or so. And we can see that the temperatures are going up um, with some fluctuations depending on the year or the decade and some natural variability. But superimposed on that is, the, is this trend and increasing warming that we see due to, uh, due to human-caused climate change. Um, <clears throat> well, it turns out that this is only uh, part of the story. And in fact, uh, the oceans play such a large role that they're actually responsible for taking up about 93% of the extra heat that's associated with global warming. So when we say uh, global warming or climate change is occurring, that warming is primarily occurring in the oceans. And so uh, if you see this plot on the right, you can see that this is the total amount of extra energy that the entire planet has accumulated over the past several decades. And we can see that the, um, the blue, both of the blue colors, the light blue and the dark blue, uh, represent the upper and deeper ocean. And those are the major players of, uh, of where all this extra heat is going. And so although we're used to just thinking of it in terms of the air temperatures going up, uh, a lot of that heat is going into the oceans. So one question is, well, why is this? Well, it's for a couple reasons. One, the oceans have a very large mass. They're orders of magnitude, more, uh, more water in the mass of water in the oceans than there is uh, mass of the atmosphere, for example. And additionally, seawater that makes up the ocean has a very high heat capacity. And what that means is that it takes a lot of energy to put into uh, the ocean 
in order to change the temperature just a tiny bit. So if we have accumulating energy, it can soak up that energy without actually changing the temperature much, and that's due to its high heat capacity. In addition, unlike the land surface where it's just uh, where uh, warming uh, mostly penetrates that upper layer of the of the land and the uh, the land itself, the oceans actually mix and overturn. And so, as we heat the surface, some of that extra heat can be mixed down and transported deep into the uh, deep down into the ocean. In addition, because of the ocean's dark color, it absorbs a lot of the incoming solar radiation, and so. It's, a, it's sort of an attractant to this incoming heat that's coming from the sun. So you may have heard of uh, you know, the, um, the warming hiatus that some people are, have been talking about occurring in the last uh, decade or so. Well, for one thing, we know if we look at 2015, as of a month or so ago when I put this figure together, we were well off, um, off this chart. And so while it doesn't really look like there's been any slowdown um, in the overall trend, especially with this year being so, this and last year being so warm. Uh, but um, if we look at, uh, that's only one part of the uh, story, as we said, and the ocean really hasn't skipped a beat. And so if we look at the increase in heat uh, going in the oceans, this really didn't slow down. And in fact, over these last few years, uh, when, when atmospheric temperatures have kind of uh, leveled off uh, temporarily, the ocean temperatures have continued uh, and the ocean heat content has continued to increase uh, at an even faster rate. <clears throat> so how do we know this? How do we know that the oceans are warming? Well, it goes back to a series of uh, advancements and uh, of observations of the ocean system. So back early on in the begin in the 1800s and early 1900s, we had a very limited view of ocean temperatures. It's a vast body of water, and most of those temperatures were measured by by special handheld devices that were sent down uh, and reversing thermometers that were that allowed uh, oceanographers and sailors to be able to measure the temperature of the water uh, at the surface and at the deep. As technology developed, especially in conjunction with the wars, uh, the, uh, we, we figured out to new tools and new technologies that allowed us to map these, uh, these, the temperature of the ocean uh, more accurately and, co and our coverage improved. By the 60s, we had uh, much more uh, improved coverage throughout the oceans, as indicated by this picture here. And then as uh, technology evolved even more, we developed these uh, new uh, in situ or uh, technologies that are measuring uh, temperature in the water, these expendable devices uh, that can be dropped off the side of a ship to measure temperatures and uh, these conductivity temperature depth devices that can be lowered from the ship in order to measure temperatures. And so by the 80s, we had a pretty comprehensive coverage of the ocean, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, but large sections of the Southern Hemisphere, which happens to be where uh, most of the ocean is, is uh, was largely unmapped because uh, that's just not where ships typically went. It wasn't until uh, recently with the development of uh, mooring systems and especially these uh, autonomous uh, profiling floats that um, can be deployed throughout the oceans that we really started to get, in, uh, get a, a beautiful view of the full distribution of temperature throughout the oceans, especially in the upper uh, one to 2,000 meters of the, of the water column. So what are these floats? These floats, there's actually, I pulled up this plot from, uh, from yesterday or the day yesterday, yeah. And uh, right now, as we speak, there's about 3,881 of these floats profiling around the ocean. And they're floating around all under their, their own power. And what they do is they come to the surface, they beam off their data to satellites, and then, uh, then they sink back down 
uh, to about a thousand meters and measure the temperature along the way. And then they just sit there, conserve some energy until they're needed the next time, about a week later or so. Then they do another profile and come back to the surface and beam that data back into uh, back into uh, the satellites, and so we can analyze it. And so as you can see here, this coverage is uh, has improved dramatically, and we're able to really monitor the changes that are going on in the oceans. In addition, we, we have these uh, repeat cruises. So I've been involved in a few of these myself. This is actually me right here on a cruise uh, in the Pacific Ocean uh, near, the, um, uh, near the equatorial Pacific. Uh, this earlier this April, and we were out there measuring uh, the temperatures, salinity, and chemical composition of the oceans on this line here. The interesting thing about this is that this these lines are repeated sections that get done every 10 years. And so what we can do is we can go back with these very uh, highly high precision instruments and map the ocean's properties and uh, features and really understand and accurately assess the changes in temperature and how much carbon dioxide has been dissolved in the seawater and what those changes are and how they're taking place across the globe on decadal timescales. <clears throat> and so what has been the change in the ocean situation? Well, we know from these observations that over the upper level, especially the upper 700 meters of the water, that there has been a large, uh, by and large, an increasing trend in the in sea, surface seawater. Some of this doesn't uh, doesn't happen. It's not uniform, and this is based on these patterns that we see with large increases in temperature in the North uh, Atlantic, as well as parts of the North Pacific and the Southern Ocean are all uh, due to changes and, um, and just the, the ocean's natural processes of circulation and how it takes up heat from the atmosphere where these uh, initial signals of warming are being absorbed from. <clears throat> and so we're, we're seeing temperatures warming in the ocean of up to 0.3 degrees Celsius. Now that might not sound a lot uh, like a lot, or like a strong temperature increase, but those small temperature increases really represent a large amount of heat in the Earth system, as we talked about earlier. <clears throat> so what are some of the consequences of this warming? Well, there's, there's multiple uh, consequences. Those include rising sea levels, uh, the changing ocean circulation, mixing and transport of heat throughout the oceans, uh, reduced nutrient supply to the surface ocean, and uh, that thereby affects the, bio the biology in the surface and can cause shifts in ecosystems, as well as um, th these changes of this ocean warming also creates, makes it more difficult for the earth, for the oceans to store and absorb carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. So I'm going to go through each of these uh, briefly, and uh, and give you an idea of of how this warm, what kind of effect this warming is having on our seas. So we know that that sea levels are rising, and this rate of uh, sea level rise, about 3.2 millimeters per year, is an increase over what we've seen in the past. And the the straightforward um, reasoning, what most people think of when they when they think of sea level rise is that, well, sea level rise is, is occurring because there's more water in the oceans now. There's all the land, ice, and snows that are melting are ending up in the ocean, and so it's just filling up. Well, it turns out that in addition to that process, there's also a significant contribution from seawater expansion due to warming. So as those temperatures increased, as I showed earlier, that actually makes just like a mercury in a, a thermometer, as you warm those that fluid, that mercury up, those molecules expand. And so it causes the surface of this ocean to rise, essentially. And so of this uh, 3.2 millimeters, about a third to a um, uh, little bit less than a half of that 
sea level rise signal is due to this this thermal expansion of um, of the ocean, just due to its uh, warming temperatures. In addition, another f effect that I mentioned was that the ocean um, uh, mixing can change, and so thinking about the ocean, the ocean is a lot like a layered um, glass of separated salad dressing. So you've got a very less dense fluid on the surf on the top, and then down below that you've got a more um, a, a more dense fluid. And these two layers or multiple layers of the oceans really they don't mix very well. And so it's a lot like a, a jar of salad dressing. And so <clears throat> uh, when we look at this uh, in this this temperature, uh, this this lack of mixing is really due to the fact that the warm water on the surface is due to the sun heating that up, and then the cold waters are down below. So if, as we lower these instruments down, temperatures in the deep ocean are quite cold, and surface waters are ocean are in the, of the ocean are much warmer. You may have even felt this if you've gone scuba diving or snorkeling in the oceans. It turns out so that that prevents some mixing from going on, the exchange between these two layers. But as we warm up the surface ocean even faster than we're warming up the deep ocean, because that's where the ocean is interacting with the atmosphere, that means that this mixing between these two layers is actually uh, becoming more and more difficult to uh, to uh, to occur. And so this exchange of, of cold, nutrient-rich waters from below um, with the surface waters is actually slowing down. And so this is important because as we increase this, what we call stratification, this limits the exchange of nutrients from, that, uh, from the deep ocean that supply uh, phytoplankton in the surface water with, uh, with necessary nutrients. It also changes the way that carbon dioxide can be uh, transferred and stored in the ocean um, and transferred into the deep, as well as heat. And it also affects um, the mixing down of phytoplankton, which is important because those phytoplankton need that sunlight. So <clears throat> what does that effect have? What's the net effect of this process, this warming on the, Earth, the Earth's oceans and that increase in stratification? Well, it turns out that if we look at this nice, beautiful picture of the patterns of ocean productivity, we we see that there's the the subtropical regions, such as the really nice, beautiful, clear waters around Hawaii or in the north uh, North Atlantic um, or around Tahiti, for example. These are places where there's a strong stratification. Of um, and strong layering, like a salad dressing, uh, in the water, and so um, what we've noticed actually is uh, is as the ocean is warming, it actually causes uh, changes in these ecosystems. So we see uh, we see equatorial. These are some pictures that I took. Uh, the equatorial waters. These these are actually different color because of there's different uh, phytoplankton, much fewer phytoplankton living in the subtropical waters than there are living in the equatorial waters or the high latitude waters of North Atlantic and North Pacific, for example. So these, these ocean subtropical gyres, these things are actually expanding. And the reason is, um, we've, we've noticed this, uh, and the reason for this is because partially because of these changes in temperatures, these warming and the shutdown of the mixing between the supply of nutrients from down below. And so, so these, these deserts, basically, where there's not much production, are, are greatly expanding. And the productive, uh, the productive regions of the ocean, such as the North Pacific, have been observed to be contracting. And so this has important implications on the fisheries and, uh, and just the ocean's productivity and cycling of carbon dioxide, for example. <clears throat> In addition, 
uh, the exchange of heat with the, with the ocean and between the atmosphere is largely moderated between, by, these, uh, by this overturning circulation. So if we look at this cross section of the Atlantic Ocean, for example, where you've got Greenland over on the right and Antarctica over on the left, we've got these warm surface currents that are moving uh, northward along the surface. And then in the North Atlantic, these uh, these waters cool down and they're very salty, and so they sink and sink down underneath. And this is called this uh, ocean overturning circulation. And so it, this process transports heat from the equator towards the poles. It also affects global and regional climate patterns. For example, it keeps Europe uh, bathed in warmer. Uh, in warmer temperatures because of all this heat that's being transported by the Gulf Stream. <clears throat> it also is responsible, for this circulation is responsible for transporting carbon dioxide and heat down into the deep ocean. And so changes in this circulation um, ha can have a big impact on all of these processes of ocean carbon storage and heat uptake. And we've seen these, these uh, changes reflected in past climate changes when we look back in the paleoclimate record. And so research uh, recently has found that it is very likely that the ocean overturning circulation will actually weaken over the 21st century. So this circulation uh, pattern that we see with warm waters moving north and then sinking as they cool, um, it's actually going to slow down. And so that's going to affect all of these processes that I just mentioned. <clears throat> In addition, we know that the ocean is an important sink for carbon dioxide that we're emitting into the atmosphere. It turns out that the oceans have absorbed about 26% of the total carbon dioxide emissions that we have emitted to the atmosphere from fossil fuel burning and from land use changes in agriculture. <clears throat> and so this, this uh, the ocean is an important storage uh, place for, uh, for this carbon. Without it, we would see much higher CO2 levels and much worse warming than we're seeing now. And so unfortunately, as the temperature of the ocean warms, it changes the ability of, it reduces the ability of the ocean to absorb this carbon dioxide. It's a lot like if you have a, a soda, a can of soda, and you sit it out in the warm sun and it warms up, and then you take a drink of it later, that water goes flat because all that, that carbon dioxide has gassed out of it. And so it's not a good uh, storage spot for carbon dioxide. So the same thing is happening with the oceans. In addition, as we change circulation, it inhibits the, uh, tran the physical transport of carbon dioxide from surface waters down into the deep ocean. Uh, and <clears throat> the chemistry is actually changing. So as we acidify the oceans, uh, as, um, as I think uh, there, there's another CCLU presentation on ocean acidification, if you wanna find out more about that, uh, but as we do so, that change in chemistry actually changes the ability for that, that carbon dioxide and it reduces the ability for that carbon dioxide to chemically disassociate and dissolve in seawater. And so all of these things combined make it more and more difficult for the ocean to take up uh, this, um, uh, this um, carbon dioxide. Uh, so, and then addition, uh, the biology um, uh, reduces uh, nutrient supply to the surface ocean. And so kind of summing things up here, what do we have? We've got these anthropogenic uh, drivers. So human caused forces, for example, CO2 and other greenhouse gases, those are driving effect, direct effects on the ocean, such as ocean warming and ocean acidification which then have a, a number of cascading effects that impact sea level rise, ocean circulation, biology, cycling of chemicals, um, ice sheets and sea ice cover, uh, oxygen concentrations in the water, 
and even terrestrial climate and weather. So a lot of these things I didn't even go into, but just to give you an idea of how um, the ocean is an important part of the climate system and it's being directly affected by these processes of warming and acidification. And in turn, these things have the uh, potential to strongly impact humans in the sense that they impact our fisheries or economies, security, uh, natural resources, or human health or property. And so uh, this is kind of, as an oceanographer myself, I, I got interested in CCL because I was looking for, like most of you, I was interested in something that would, uh, would do something about the changes that I've seen. And so I learned about CCL, I found out about you know, CCL's reputation and methodology, and, and, I, and I had this feeling that this, while all the scientific understanding is critical, it's not really sufficient to address the problem. So in my day-to-day -day job, I'm not doing enough, uh, enough to actually uh, get changes take place and, and stop this changing climate. Um, and so it's, it's a matter of really deciding what we want our future to look like. <clears throat> Do we want it to look like, uh, you know, with low emissions or high emissions by the end of the century? And it's really about, you know, the impacts that's going to have on the oceans in terms of do we want the pH to be uh, ocean acidification to just proceed in a small amount or do we want the changes to be uh, quite drastic? Do we want to look at, do we want to be looking at a planet with very little sea ice at the pole or do we want, um, uh, or do we want to reserve and maintain the, the sea ice systems that we have today? And so all of these things kind of, um, are coming together for me. And so that's why I got uh, involved with CCL. And really it's, it's, it's about making this trajectory and this transition from uh, the pathway and the emissions pathway that we're on right now into something that's more sustainable and for a stable climate. And so, um, so doing this and, and uh, sticking down to a change, uh, small changes in the climate and, and making changes in our emission patterns, um, that's really what's going to prevent these changes from taking place and these big impacts from happening in the oceans. All right, I think that's about it. Um, and uh, yeah, so does anybody have any questions? And I noticed uh, there was, I got a little bit of a warning here, detected some potential issues with my network condition, uh, connection. Did you guys have catch all of that or did you, were there some problems? No, uh, I think everything came through clearly on my end. Uh, it sounded great. And um, okay. that's just a ton of great information. That was, uh, I like the way that you um, uh, compare uh, stratification to the salad dressing jar. That was really good. <laughs> that made a lot of sense to me. Um, so if you guys have questions, uh, feel free to uh, star one on your on your cell phone or uh, click the little microphone symbol uh, next to your name. If uh, you guys don't have a question, I've got a question or two, but I will let you guys go first. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, it's clear that uh, warming affects ocean circulation. But uh, is the, is the uh, opposite also true? Uh, can changes in ocean circulation affect the warming? Absolutely, yes. And and ocean circulation is is one of the as I as I mentioned, ocean circulation actually uh, is important is an important driver in our climate system. It's how about a third of the heat um, that I have here in Alaska is because the oceans are transporting that heat from the tropics up to the north. And so, um, and so we're very grateful for that. So yes, so changes in, in ocean circulation, it, it can go both ways, basically. If we change the circulation, we can change the climate. And if we change the climate, it can change the um, circulation patterns. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I got a question, Andrew. I'll go ahead and go next. Um, 
you were mentioning which I thought was those uh, floating robots. That's really cool. Uh, those things are pretty sharp how they yeah. go down and come back up. Um, but you mentioned, you know, that the limitations we we've had historically in covering the ocean. So other, I mean, I guess what I would like to, because you know, we I have a regional area here. You know, we're on the Gulf Coast, and so uh -huh. um, you know, Texas is a little different. They don't really to care too much about the ocean, but the other states in, in, in the Gulf Coast do. Um, and we are asked questions about um, a couple of things. One is um, the rate of change. So what I've heard uh, from certain offices that we've been in is, well, you know, the pH level has only gone from 8 to 7.9, you know, in 200 years. That doesn't sound like a big deal, you know, so it's like... <laughs> How do you, uh, or how would you help us or help me um, get them to the place where they understand that, you know, it's not a linear thing that, uh, you know, or how, how could you explain that? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think it, you know, it, it goes into not just like ocean acidification issues, but also uh, ocean temperature things, right? And or even just climate change in general, we see this. We see this like uh, this point being brought up often, where well, it's just a degree or so. You know, that's not that big of a deal, right? But I guess what I would answer to that in terms of ocean temperatures is that that actually means, as I said, ninety three percent of the extra heat of of global ninety three percent of global warming is essentially the warming of the oceans, right? And so even though we're ha we have small, you know, visible incremental changes in the, in the ocean's temperatures, those can have big effects on the circulation patterns, the, the uh, distribution of species or the productivity of our fisheries. And so these, these little things, and we're seeing these, these things happen, like, um, like along the East Coast, for example, uh, there's shifting ecosystems. And we're seeing, you know, more and more the lobster fisheries, for example, on Cape Cod are are not doing so well. But up further north, they're they're actually doing better as those as those temperature patterns uh, and um, distributions move north. When we're talking about uh, your question, it was specifically about kind of, uh, you know, pH is only changing a slight amount. I guess my answer to that would be that. Um, is that in terms of total change in the concentration of, of acid ions, so hydrogen ions in seawater, we're talking about a logarithmic pH is on a logarithmic scale. So that means a, um, you know, a change in one unit, uh, one unit from seven to eight, for example, means actually a, ten, uh, a factor of 10 change in the concentration. So even though the number may sound small in terms of an incremental change, it has huge impacts on the chemical reactions that are occurring in the water. It has a huge impact on the, on the biology that depend on that, that status of that, that chemical environment. And we've seen from sensitivity experiments and uh, um, mesocosm experiments where um, even small changes can have a big impact on organisms. Um, and, uh, and so there, therefore, even if it is sound small, it, uh, you know, it doesn't mean the consequences are. Okay, yeah, and so I guess that's exactly what I was looking for there. It's, uh, you know, it's not a linear increase, it is a logarithmic increase, and therefore it yeah. has a, a, a much greater impact than, than what it sounds. Uh, that's what I was yeah. looking for. So, so uh, maybe you should just re rework that scale, make it easy for everybody. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the other question I had, and then I'll, I'll open up so see if anyone else has any other questions as well. Like, you know, we were talking about that ocean coverage. Uh, what proxies do we have, you know, to, to to, for for that gap that we had, say back a uh, hundred years ago, I mean at sea ice, I know that we're at, you know we always talk about ice cores for, you know from my understanding that was for air temperatures. Is that the same type of proxy that we've used to make a you know historical case for what the ocean temperatures used to be as well? No, actually there there are temperature records for the ocean um, or paleoclimate temperature records for the ocean. 
but those are mostly uh, derived from um, things that are found in the sediments on the seafloor. And so what you have is typically, you know, you have um, organisms that are living in the surface ocean and they're, they're um, the chemistry of the, of their, of their bodies and the isotopes, the different balance of the ratios of the isotopes that they make in their shells, for example, are related to the temperature. And so as, you know, as they're, if they're growing, if they were growing in cold temperatures in the ocean, then uh, we would be able to see that in the isotopic signatures in their, um, in their shells. And so what we do is we can go look at, at corals, um, coral cores, or we can look at sediments uh, in, on the bottom of the seafloor. And those particles that had rained down and sank down to the bottom, uh, they, those do reveal um, what uh, overlying uh, ocean temperatures were. Okay, so it's mostly living things uh, versus ice cores. Yeah, like it is with yeah. Yeah. surface temperature. Okay, awesome. All right, uh, any other questions? You guys can uh, star one your phone or click the microphone symbol next to your name. All right. Well, I think that's it for tonight, uh, Andrew. I uh, once again I uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity and the, the the knowledge that you've uh, uh, given us this evening. It was um, certainly uh, jam packed, but uh, really great, useful stuff. Um, like everyone said, uh, this has been recorded, so if you did miss any uh, part of it for whatever reason, uh, you guys can check that out on um, CCLU page on Community tomorrow. Um, other than that, I'll say good night. Uh, next week on CCLU, we have uh, Ellie launching her Move Over Misconception Project. So you know, a lot of people are excited about that and hearing how we uh, move Congress past their misconceptions. And now that I understand the pH balance and how that works, I can help them overcome that misconception as well. So yeah, I appreciate it, Andrew. You guys have a great evening. Thank you. No problem. Good to talk to you guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.